God's covenant people and a chosen nation, rich in heritage, culture, and history. A land and a people tied so closely to their forefathers that in 3,000 years, their culture, convictions, and ideals have remained almost entirely unchanged. But Israel is not merely a nation rich in heritage. It is also a nation with a prophetic destiny. But before we can understand their future, we must first understand their past. Since Joshua parted the Jordan River and led the children of Israel onto this soil, this has been a land reserved for God's people. God commanded Joshua to build an altar on Mount Ebal and to write upon it the words of the law. This altar was found on Mount Ebal, which dates back to that period. Here, Joshua divided the tribes of Israel on either side of the Ark of the Covenant, half towards Mount Ebal and half towards Mount Gerizim, and the priests read to the people the blessings they would receive if they obeyed the law and the cursings they would receive if they disobeyed. They did not keep their oaths and soon fell into darkness and destruction. But the Lord also promised that their seed would be remembered and that after a period of chastisement, they would again become a blessed people in a blessed land. The altar on Mount Ebal was used for animal sacrifice, but the Jews ceased the practice of sacrificing animals after their temple was destroyed in 70 AD. They believe that there is now no place worthy to offer sacrifice, but that the practice will be reinstated with all its original ceremony and laws found in the Old Testament when the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem. However, this small group of Samaritans north of Jerusalem still believe the ritual should be practiced. On the same day in May, every year, the head of every household brings a sacrificial ram to the ceremony. As in the days of ancient Israel, it is a ceremony of great celebration, and Gentiles are invited to watch from a distance. This group now number only about 500, partially because the genetic problems brought about by intermarriage. Heavily armed Israeli soldiers surround the annual event to prevent terrorists from disrupting the celebration. Opposing factions within the group jockey for position, sometimes creating a spirit of antagonism. The leaders of the sect begin a chant, which builds an emotional momentum. Then, at a predetermined point, the heads of the 24 households flash their knives and the sacrifice is soon over. It is at this point the celebration begins in earnest. As this is the peace offering sacrifice, the innards are burnt, but the body is eaten. Under the law of Moses, sacrifices were buried in complex with a multitude of rules to govern each procedure. A drop of the innocent's blood represented by the ram and symbolizing the Messiah's blood is placed on the forehead, meaning good luck, and must be shared with others. The ritual is a symbolic reminder of the pain and anguish which the Messiah would suffer for the redemption of his people. Joseph Smith taught that the sons of Levi will again offer sacrifice in righteousness. To complete the restoration of all things, sacrifices will again be offered in this dispensation. About 600 years before Joshua had built the altar on Mount Ebal, a sacrifice of much greater consequence than a lamb was about to take place. The prophet Abraham had been commanded by the Lord to take his only son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and upon the great rock there, offer Isaac as a sacrifice. In 687 AD, Muslims built a dome which covers this rock. The monument known as the Dome of the Rock lies within the walls of old Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock is thought to be the site of Solomon's and Herod's temples. 
This is said to be the place from which the great high priest, the king of Salem, Melchizedek and his people, were translated and taken to heaven to join Enoch and his followers. This is where David set up his tribal headquarters. It is also believed by Jews to be the burial place of the Ark of the Covenant. It was here that as an infant, Jesus was presented to the priests and consecrated to God. And as a 12-year-old, astonished the scribes with his wisdom and understanding. And it was on the northern end of this same mount that the Savior made the ultimate sacrifice, as was symbolized centuries earlier by Abraham and Isaac. The rock of Mount Moriah extends over an area 40 by 52 feet and protrudes above the shrine's floor about seven feet. At the time of David, this was the threshing floor of Aranah, and a hole led down to a cave where the grain was stored. This cavern is believed by many to have been the sacred heart of Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies. This sanctuary is one of the most holy spots on earth to the Muslims, who do not normally allow photographs to be taken inside the shrine, making these pictures very rare. Solomon's temple was built here on Mount Moriah in about 950 B.C., but was basically destroyed in 587 B.C. by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt in 516 B.C., then repaired and refurbished in the days of Herod, just prior to the birth of Christ. The western wall of the Temple Mount, or the Wailing Wall as it is commonly referred, is now the only remnant of Temple Mount available to the Jews making it a very holy area and the place to worship and pray. The area in front of the wall is divided by a small partition. Men pray on one side and women on the other. Many devoted Jews faithfully trek here daily, despite age and infirmities. Sincere Jewish worshipers take very literally the admonition to pray with all their heart, might, mind, and strength. Most seem oblivious to curious spectators, although many Orthodox Jews will not allow their photograph to be taken because they believe that will make what was expressly forbidden by Moses a graven image. For years, Jews have stood before the Wailing Wall praying that tomorrow the Messiah will come. Other prayers are written on scraps of paper and forced into cracks and crevices in the wall. The Jews state that from the temple, a tunnel ran from the Holy of Holies out through the western wall. The tunnel was used by priests if they became ceremonially unclean while in the temple. A priest was considered unclean if he touched a dead fly or spider, or through the breaking of any number of other prescribed conditions. The priests needed a quick escape from the inner sanctuary because they believed that they would be struck down as the sons of Aaron had been if they did not leave the temple immediately and become cleansed. Though Jewish leaders had known that they must eventually rebuild the temple, they had not been exactly sure as to where the temple should be built. They realized that if they could find this entrance located on the western wall and follow the tunnel to its end, they would then know the exact location of Solomon's temple. They also realized this meant excavations would need to be made under the Moslem's great shrine. During the Six-Day War in 1967, the Jews obtained possession of the entire Temple Mount and began to excavate along the Western Wall. Down here, probably over 30 feet, Glenn. As of May 1981, the concrete reinforced shaft extended the entire length of the Western Wall, approximately 1,250 feet but they still had not found the entrance to the tunnel. Then, in August of 1981, they began to excavate about 20 feet higher on the wall and soon discovered the tunnel entrance. Here, you can see this is the country just brand new. The tunnel was open for about 150 feet. The rabbis were anxious to clear out the last 35 feet of debris and finally know for sure where they should build the temple. 
However, the War of 67 could have continued to an even bloodier end. So as a concession, the Jews had given back control of Temple Mount to the Muslims. Now Jews gather and worship only below the Mount, while the Muslims are found above. So when Muslims heard them digging below their sacred shrine, they went to the Israeli government and filed a protest. Where the, new tunnel... the government ordered the excavation stopped and the tunnel was sealed up. Dr. Skousen, for anything as important as that, why would the Jews stop excavating? I just can't understand it. Well, all of us were in hopes that somehow or another they would continue the excavation and we would really find out where that temple was located. But you have to keep in mind something. The, the Israelis realize they're only about 3 million strong. And the Muslims uh, are about 110 million strong. And if they aggravated the Muslims to the point where there was a holy war against them, there's 110 million against 3 million. And so they just don't want to do anything that would aggravate the Muslim people. And they figured that they could just wait until such time as the temple had to be rebuilt, the circumstances were right, and then they would finish the excavation, they would know the exact location of the temple, and that's when they would do their work. So, to avoid a misunderstanding, or a, possibly a holy war, they sealed it off until some future time. But the excavation was headed in the general direction of the Dome of the Rock, and one cannot help but wonder, when the tunnel is finally excavated, if it will lead to one of these sealed doors below the threshing floor of Arana. Well, Dr. Skousen, with that big mosque standing there, how are they going to build the temple there? Uh, when the 67 war was over and the Israelis occupied the territory, the press said, well, now are you going to build your temple there? They said, yes, in this generation. And where are you going to build it? Well, where the Temple of Solomon was. Well, isn't that where the Shrine of the Rock was located? Well, he said, traditionally, yes, traditionally. Well, then you're going to tear down the Dome of the Rock. No, the chief rabbi said, not at all. We will never disturb other people's sacred places. Well, the reporter said, but you're going to build your temple? Yes. And you're going to build it where Solomon's temple was? Yes. And traditionally, that's where the Shrine of the Rock is? Yes. How are you going to do that without tearing down the Dome of the Rock? And the old rabbi shrugged his shoulders and said, that's God's problem. <laughs> and that's just the way they feel about it. If God wants a temple there, he's got to set up the circumstances so that the Dome of the Rock is removed and they can rebuild their temple without them doing anything themselves to defile the sacred places of the Muslims, the Christians, or anybody else. Each time I come to Jerusalem, I can't help but think how many prophecies have been fulfilled in the last hundred years. Not only here in this land, but also in America. See, the Lord promised the Nephites that what he was going to do was to raise up a land of liberty in America. A land where the gospel could be restored. In fact, the only land where it could be restored. And that he would then restore his church. That he would have temples built that the Savior would appear. He has appeared in America, of course, many times. And he has taught the people and has trained prophets on how to spread the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And, of course, we now have about 30,000 missionaries out all over the world telling them about this great message of the restoration. So those prophecies are being fulfilled right at the time when the Lord is also bringing Judah back to the land of their fathers. In 1841, Orson Hyde was sent to dedicate Palestine for the return of the Jews. Over 130 years later, members of the church purchased this plot on the Mount of Olives and built this memorial to Orson Hyde and the dedicatory prayer he offered here. And here they are in this great land now. They have war after war, but they keep building the cities. They keep beautifying it and preparing it for their great future. For example, you see those gates down there, the golden gates? That has to be opened up, beautified, and prepared for the time when Christ will come and enter through those gates. As a matter of fact, the prophets say that no matter how many wars they have, it will continue to grow and prosper and be beautified. And eventually, the time will come when there'll be so much wealth accumulated here that this area will all become the envy of the Gentiles. 
and they will then mobilize a tremendous military force and they will come down here determined to conquer this land and that will bring israel and the jews to one of the greatest crises in their modern history it's called the battle of armageddon fortified and inhabited since ancient times megiddo is the only passage from the north to egypt the persians babylonians and every other army that has conquered this land has of necessity had to control this small stretch of land to succeed. Now, the site of Megiddo is of particular significance to us in modern times because the prophets indicate that the great battle of Armageddon that everyone talks about so much is going to begin right here at Megiddo. That's why it is called the Battle of Armageddon. Beautiful cities will have been built up and down, and it says they will be undefended that is their unwalled cities so that when the attack comes i mean it just practically bowls over those cities rolls all over them and and goes almost all the way to jerusalem before there is any formidable resistance the man who will be in charge of this entire area at the time of the attack or the, the war of armageddon as we call it will be prince david sometimes referred to in the scriptures as the branch and it will be he who will have built the temple. And to his amazement, a siege will be set up around this city, which will last three and one half years. Now, it's important to understand that Gog actually is a prince over the Gentiles. And the word Magog is the, uh, constitutes the people of the Gentiles. So when it says that the attack against Jerusalem and Israel is by Gog and Magog, it means Prince Gog and the people of the Gentiles in one massive assault on Israel. And they will come in with such sweeping fury until they reach Jerusalem. When they reach Jerusalem, they are stopped, but by a force that it comes as a surprise. Here in Jerusalem, Prince David will have, helping him, two prophets of God that have the power of the priesthood over the elements. They have the power over water, they have the power over scourges, and they have the power to call down fire from heaven. Now that's what stops Gog and Magog. And so, in the final analysis, Gog gathers together his great forces and said, we will make one final surge to see if we can break through. And by all means, try to kill those two prophets who have this power to hold us back, <clears throat> have even the power over the elements. And so they make this tremendous attack on the city and they do break through. They make it. And they get in and they finally locate these two prophets. And they kill both of them. And they leave them lying in the streets. They could be lying in the streets just like this. And God will not allow them to be buried. He wants them just lying in the street where all of the people can see that he finally overcame them. And he destroyed them. And then he said, we will celebrate for three and one half days. We will stop the war temporarily. Well, he's already devastated half the city. Half the people are killed. And the other half are all clustered down in this part of this section of the city, not knowing what will happen to them next, expecting any minute to get the final bloodbath. And they're waiting for this during the three and a half days of celebration by Gog and his host. In that agonizing moment, when the whole city of Jerusalem is surrounded by the forces of Gog and Magog, and they are ready to make their final attack to just completely annihilate this population and these people, a miracle will occur. The scripture says the voice of the Lord would speak to the two dead prophets lying in the street. They would be immediately resurrected and would join the Savior and his hosts. And it says that they will descend and Jesus will stand on this mount. And at the point where he stands, it will suddenly just divide in two. This would appear to be the natural place where it would divide the scripture says half the mountain will move to the south. The other half of the mountain will move to the north. A great canyon will open up here and terrified people will see an opportunity to escape. They will flee through that canyon onto the other side. And when they got over there and saw their savior in all his magnificence and glory, they would surround him and just in amazement that he was as, he was as great as the prophet said he would be. And it says that when they surround him, they will suddenly look and say to him, what are these wounds in thy hands and in thy feet? And Jesus will say, 
These are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. You don't mean you are Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Yes, yes, I am he. And then a sense of mourning will come over them that their ancestors did not recognize Jesus when he came the first time, exactly as Isaiah had said he would come in chapter 53. But then a spirit of rejoicing will return to them and they will surround him and bring him down that great canyon that used to be the Mount of Olives in a great Hosanna parade. And they will come down till they pass the Garden of Gethsemane. What memories that will bring to the mind of Jesus Christ. Then they will cross the great brook Kidron and gradually wind up the pathway here all the way to the beautiful Golden Gate. And they will then triumphantly take Jesus through the Golden Gate and into the temple which was built to honor him. And this gate would then be closed, the scripture says, and never opened again. Of course, when the Jewish people take over this whole area, this gate will be greatly beautified. Uh, at the moment, you see, it's all blocked up. And that's because when the Turks rebuilt this wall in the 1500s, they didn't want the, the Messiah to come and uh, take over this territory too soon. They decided they would postpone it. They just block up the gate so he couldn't go through it and fulfill that prophecy. The Moslems also hoped to discourage the Jewish Messiah from entering the Golden Gate. So they began planting their dead in front of it, believing that their spirits would keep him away. You have us to the point that Christ is in the temple with the Jews. Will all the Jews be converted? The prophets say that they will be converted as a nation. Maybe one of the reasons is because there will be several great miracles that will occur right at this time. For example, they will have been surrounded by the forces, the armies of Gog and Magog. Fire from heaven will consume all but one-sixth of that army, and the remnant will go as far away as they can, clear to the seashore. That's a very impressive miracle that happens. Secondly, after Jesus goes in through that gate and into the temple, there is a day and a night and a day with no darkness, just as it was in America when Jesus was born. There's the second great miracle. They will all be so tremendously impressed that it says they will be converted as a nation. As soon as the people of Judah realized that their Messiah really was a divine Messiah, and not a general or a soldier like they'd been expecting, or a politician, the word just spread everywhere rapidly. Jehovah is here. Now, they decided to change the name of the city. The scripture says they will change the name of the city. They will no longer call it Jerusalem. They will call it Jehovah Shammah, which means Jehovah the Lord God of Israel dwells here. And that word will spread down among the Arabs and the other peoples all through this land. And the prophets say that they will take hold of the garment of a Jew and say, please, can we go up to Jerusalem with you to worship? We have heard that God is with you. Do we know what will be happening in America at the same time? Yes, some tremendous things will be happening. Uh, this is the time when the Savior will be building up the new Jerusalem in America. And when Zion cities will be built, the whole extent of the Western Hemisphere, North America, Central America, and South America. This will be the time when the ten tribes come down. And the membership of the church will be multiplied many times over. And there shall be a new Jerusalem. A city not here in Israel, but in America. A city which, like its ancient counterpart, will be a holy city. This is the valley of Adam on Diamon. This is where Adam gathered his posterity three years before his death and blessed them. But more important to us is that this is the place where Adam will return to Jesus Christ the keys of dominion over the earth that he was given when he was first placed upon the earth. It is here that the great priesthood conference will be held, and all who have held keys of authority on the earth will give an accounting of their stewardship, and directions will be given to the priesthood members who have been invited to attend. And in those days shortly before the appearance of the Savior in glory, 
temples will dot the earth, and the area surrounding Adam on Diamond will become a center of the saints. The great temple of Zion in Jackson County, Missouri, will be completed upon the cornerstones laid out by the prophet Joseph Smith over 150 years ago. Other temples will also be completed on sites such as Far West. This land was dedicated by Joseph Smith. The cornerstones were laid, but the temple was never built. Prophecy teaches us this work shall go forth, and the prophecy of Isaiah will be fulfilled. Out of Zion shall go forth the law, which shall be in America, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So it will be as exciting a time in America as it is for the people who are over here in Israel. So when Christ appears here to the Jews, is that his second coming? No, that's not the second coming. That's just Christ's appearance to the Jews. You see, previously he appears to the people of Joseph in America, then he comes over and appears to the Jews, and that prepares the earth for a tremendous amount of work that must be done before the millennium. And when the earth is ready for that big final cons consumption, uh, that cleansing of the whole earth that it talks about, that is when the millennium comes. And the second coming is when he appears in the heavens and everybody sees him simultaneously. And those who've been wicked, who didn't believe he even existed, will be terrified. And the saints whom they persecuted will be gratified because their prayers will have been answered. That will be the second coming. Just as they were promised through Joshua, Israel shall again become a blessed people in a blessed land. And as prophesied, that day will commence in fullness when the Savior divides the Mount of Olives, delivering them from their enemies. It is through the miraculous gift of prophecy that man is able to participate in the building of God's kingdom. The faithful and believing work diligently while others ridicule. Prophecy has told us of the integral part the Jews will play in the preparation of the Savior's second coming. They will rebuild the temple and resume the ancient practices their forefathers have handed down through the ages. Recently, in a Jerusalem synagogue, a number of young rabbis have begun studying the temple, its architecture, its clothing, and its sacrificial ritual. They believe the temple will be rebuilt soon, and they know they must be ready. Through all recorded history, God's people have always been blessed with the gifts of prophecy and revelation. The great Jehovah has said, Though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled. Every prophecy proclaimed by the servants of God will be fulfilled. Prophecy, the plans of God made known to man. The opportunity God has given to man to prepare for the future.